Hey, what's going on guys? This is Youth Man and this is my new friend Ryan. I'm up here in Kansas City. We're doing about nine home theater tours in a period of four days. And so today is day number one. We're on the second home, but Ryan, I've been here since 4 p.m. and it's now a quarter till midnight. Yeah. And the reason is, honestly, we just had a ton of fun over here hanging out in your home we theater. covered a lot of material we did a lot today and yeah. it was i lost track of time i mean there was a period there where i got kicked out of my own home theater for sure and other people were utilizing it for de demos somebody brought a kaleidoscope somebody else brought other speakers in to my demo to do outside there so yeah. people were demoing my own home theater yeah and i wasn't in the home theater <laughs> for sure <laughs> So it was a great experience. I'm glad everybody had yeah. fun because that's the key here is yeah. that everybody's enjoying themselves because one thing is coming over and showcasing this theater to people. Sure. But if people aren't having fun, it yeah. really doesn't matter. And seeing that enjoyment on people's faces yeah. and, and just as long as they're enjoying themselves, that's what really matters to me and that's what this hobby's all about. Yeah. And I think that's one of the greatest things about doing these home theater tours. I love seeing gear I love experiencing great sound, but I really, really enjoy getting mm -hmm. to know people and hearing their story. And in this video, we're going to share his story. We're going to share his whole home theater, talk about the gear, but also like how we got here, you know, and part of your journey. And so it's just been an incredible night. We just finally kicked everybody out like, look, yeah. guys, we got to get rolling on yeah. this thing. But we've just been having a blast just checking out your home. You've got a beautiful home. You've got a beautiful family. You've got beautiful dogs. Thank you. And we've got just this incredible multi kind of purpose space. I mean, we've got a bar back here. We've got a kitchen back there. And so... Be calling it a kitchen is being very yeah. gracious. And actually, the kitchen, that may be one of the regrets, but we can get into that when yeah. we get talk about that in the video. Sure. Um, I think I may do things, would have done things differently, but you know, you, you live, you learn, yep. it works out. Um, we can talk about that when we get there, but it's been an awesome experience doing the room. But the, again, the best part of this mm -hmm. room is just being able to share it with other people. And that's yeah. why we did it. Yeah. Cause frankly, I hate going to the movie theaters. It's, right. it's a terrible experience because my experience is dictated by other people, gotcha. which it is here too, but it's other people that I don't know. Mm -hmm and therefore dislike, because I inherently <laughs> dislike everybody that I don't know. Right. Um, but here I get to experience it with other people, to, with other people. but it's people I know, mm -hmm. and that's what makes it fun. Because any experience is great if it's a good experience, but it's even better if you can experience with it with others. Sure. We had some newcomers yeah. here today, which is, which is awesome. Um, experiencing with others is great, sure. but it's also really exciting to showcase and get other people involved that yeah. have never done this before and that's that's really part of what keeps me going is seeing other people go through what I went through for the first time sure. and kind of being able to relive that yeah. and it's a uh, it's it's awesome each and every time it happens and helping them along their journey yeah. as they kind of come into the yeah. hobby and and Ryan you've got a really unique opportunity up here because you have a core group of people mm -hmm in the Kansas City, both Kansas City, Missouri, as well as Kansas City, yep. Kansas. And I just found out that there are two different yep. places. There's two cities yeah, named Kansas like, City. I guess that's a real thing. But it's cool that even both of these cities have come together mm -hmm. in this area. And y'all do kind of like monthly what they call crawls, yep. where you know maybe this weekend we're hanging out at Ryan's place, we're checking out his awesome system. And we're demo and we're tweaking your color calibration and all this stuff. We tried to color calibrate this pair projector. <laughs> we'll get it. We'll get into that story. That, that's an interesting one. But then maybe next month you're going to go mm -hmm. over to Chad's house and next month over to Anthony's house. And, and then you just get a chance to experience different homes, different ways of doing it. Yep. And that's one of the, the reasons why I love the home theater tours is because you guys get a chance to kind of see and experience. Maybe you don't have that opportunity to to meet other people in your area. And so I kind of want to bring you along to kind of just see how other people do it. Well, we got nine yeah. this weekend. Yeah. Uh, we got we two today. Yep. And we got two tomorrow, right. three Sunday, and right, and four Monday. I don't, or three Monday, something I'll, like that. I'll be honest, I it's, hope it's two on Monday. <laughs> it's something crazy. Yeah, yeah. But it's, I don't think people would necessarily consider Kansas City to be a mecca of home theater. Yeah. And it's, 
Maybe it's because there's nothing else to do here. Mm. I mean, if people make fun of us for that, but we kind of embrace it. Uh, it. There is a lot of home theater going on here, and there's a very active group. I think the Kansas City thread on AVS forums yes. is, I believe, the most active out of any mm. of the localized home theater groups. Sure. And it's it's been a phenomenal experience. It's been an awesome group of people to... Yeah collaborate and have fun with and go, like you said, go and see their theaters. And a lot of these guys, I mean, I've been to the theaters multiple times um, and we've actually had some experiences and they've actually helped me design this room and sure. we've had some stories that have come up, come up along the way that we'll talk about going as we go through this. Yeah. But it's, it's, been, it's been a great ride. And yeah. I'm glad that I found myself here mm -hmm. and I'm glad that I've found myself in a community that is as active and as embracing as this one is. Yeah. Well, Ryan, this was literally my first time experiencing, I guess, what I consider a, a full Martin Logan home theater. I mean, we've got... There's not very many. Yeah. You don't see that very often. I see a lot of two-channel Martin Logans, but you've got a few Martin Logan speakers around There's here. a few. So yep. kind of walk us through, like, what is your setup? Kind of what's the layout? And what are you running speaker-wise, maybe subwoofer-wise? Sure. So the room... Well, first off, we'll start with why I did Martin Logan. So... Originally, I worked at Best Buy a long time ago, mm -hmm. and they had in their demo rooms, and this is before they went to like their true Magnolia theaters, which the Magnolia, I think it's based in California. Okay. And this was when they had the baby, when they brought in Magnolia theaters, but it was like the baby Magnolia room right. where they had all of the speakers in there. And you're like, oh, these are awesome. But that was before you knew any better. And it was just, it, is, it was what it was. But I saw and heard what I'll call the baby Martin Logans. Um, and I've got some in the back, the Electro mm -hmm. Motions. And I think it was, I don't remember what version I heard first. It wasn't these because it was years ago. Yeah. Um, but that's really what started this whole room was I fell in love with the sound. I actually really liked the directionality because I felt like I could focus things. Um, I just liked, I liked the technology. I liked the how they looked. I just really liked the entire experience that the electrostatic speaker brought. Yeah. And that captivated me and catapulted me into this room. So I eventually bought a pair of these electro motions. Mm -hmm. Something else about this room is virtually all the speakers are used, um, with the exception of the Atmos channels. Those I had to get new because they're kind of hard to find and mm -hmm. everybody that I wanted to buy used, they were trying to scam me. So we didn't go down that road, but all of the bed layer is electrostatic. Mm -hmm. So up front, I've got the Renaissance 15As, the big boys. Man, they're monsters. And then the 34C on the floor, which in and of itself is a monstrous center channel. And then around the side, wall-mounted EFX. Um, and the story behind them is, is how I ended up with six is they're used. And I found an ad and he was selling six for an amazing price. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, if I don't buy all six, I'm effectively losing money. <laughs> exactly. So I have to buy all six. Certainly. Yeah. So I bought all six. And my wife's looking at me through this whole thing. Why do you need so many speakers? What you had is fine. Right. Um, so I got six of those wall-mounted EFX, and then the babies, which used to be my front sound stage, are now demoted to the rears. Right. Um, and then on the ceiling is six 35 XTIs. Front is a 50 XT on the height, so the front height to the 50 XT. And the reason that exists is because it was my center channel with the baby electro motions, but when I tried to sell it, nobody wanted it, yeah. and the ch the shipping was so expensive that it didn't really make cost-effective sense to get rid of it. So mm -hmm. I thought, well, it's going to be high channel now. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's where it ended up. Repurposed. Because I didn't really have yeah. another place to put it sure. upstairs. There's in the living room. It's a sound bar. People give sound bars. Yeah. They think they're terrible. They've got their place. Sure. And that speaker was too big for the mantle. It wasn't. It didn't have the correct dispersion. Okay. So it ended up as a height channel. And then the subs are two JTR 4000 ULFs. Um, and then actually in the couch, that the couch is a new addition is nine bass shakers, which may be overboard. I mean, this whole room is kind of <laughs> overboard. Right, yeah. um, and it's actually wired for more. So up in front, we've got two unused height channel routings for, okay. for wire that aren't so being utilized. Always add I those. could, okay. yep. And they're hidden behind the velvet up in the Middle, we've got a Voice of God channel. It's not, it's run. I just mm -hmm. don't have a speaker. Then I've got two more Atmos channels that are hanging out and then two rear heights. 
Um, and then I actually have conduit up in the front so the idea behind when I built this room is I have no idea what's going to happen to the spec. Awesome. I don't know where things are going to go. So I'm building this room. When we're building the house, I want to be able to grow with it mm -hmm. no matter what happens. Yeah. So I tried to run conduit in locations that I thought may, be ex may experience expansion. Sure. Right. So behind the screen, there's conduit. There's an outlet back behind the screen because if we ever move away from projectors and we go back to large scale TVs and they are getting bigger. Yeah, they are. I wanted to have power there mm -hmm. without having a worrying about the need to run that yeah. later. And there's conduit that runs through the wall to connect and I've run um, pull string to make it easy on myself sure. instead of cursing myself. Like, Why <laughs> do you think of this? I exactly. wanted to just overdo everything yeah. so that I would look back and just like, thank you. Thank you for remembering yeah. or thinking it or having the foresight to be able to do that. I think there's a lot of wisdom in that, especially if, for those of you that are building a home, say, from scratch. Mm -hmm. It's a whole lot cheaper and easier to run your speaker Absolutely. wires. Like you said, you may not think you're going to want 11 speakers or six at most, but running cable is super, super cheap. Well, and I mean, really it is expensive. as long as you're not having to deal with the drywall because if you're mm -hmm. on bare studs, yeah. It's so easy, yeah. right? Yep. And even if you're paying somebody else to do it, yeah. I think the people that we had do it was, it was like $75 a drop, which yeah. may seem kind of expensive. Sure. But man, when you're thinking about saving yourself time in the future and then not having to deal with drywall mm -hmm. or pulling wire that you can't yeah. see or dealing with studs, right. man, $75 is yeah. like a drop in the yeah. bucket when you think about the hours yeah. that you could spend cursing yeah. and just hating yeah. dealing with that experience. and. Doing a home theater is something that you should really love to do. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to try and remove as much of that, those issues that we may encounter in the future so that it was a fun process here throughout. And if something changed, I'd be like, hey, I've already done that. Right. Let's just drop that in. So Now you mentioned you've got two JTR Captivator yep. 4000 ULF. So these yep. are big subwoofers, but I don't see them. They're big. Like, where are they at? So they're in the wall. So up in front, I've got a left and a right. And this was a problem. So initially, all of these speakers were in my living room at my old house before we moved. And I'm lucky enough that I have a wife that I won't say supports my hobby. Yeah. I will say tolerates my hobby. Exactly. It never meets the wife approval factor rating. Sure. But it's enough that she allows it to happen. Mm -hmm. All right. So they were in my living room. And it the front channels, all three, and these subs are enormous. Like, the subs are effectively the size of small refrigerators. Absolutely. They weigh 300 pounds. Absolutely. They're four feet tall, four feet long. Um, they're enormous. Mm -hmm. And so when I actually got them at my old house, I was so excited that I didn't wait for anybody. And they came in the garage, and from my garage, they came on a pallet. Right. And they were, so well, let's back up here a little bit. So they were supposed to be an exponent pair. I got them in 2020. Well, Exponent in 2020 didn't happen. Yeah. So they were supposed to be the Exponent pair. Jeff from JTR was going to give me a deal. And the amazing man that he was, Exponent didn't happen. He honored that deal. Mm. And that's where they came from. Awesome. So everything in this room is effectively used with the exception of the heights. I think we talked about that earlier. Um, these were going to be used, but he honored the deal. So they were effectively new. Yeah. They got delivered. I was so excited about it. My wife's asking me when I ordered them, why the hell did you get two? You're telling me they're four feet long, four feet tall, weigh 300 pounds. Why do you need two? Very I'm familiar. like, again, theory of this room, if you're going to do it, you overdo it. That's, right. That is my motto. Yeah. Okay, so I've got them in my garage. I'm home alone. They weigh 300 pounds. i got to go up four steps to get mm -hmm. in my living room. How am I going to do this? Right. I push the pallet over the staircase, and then I flip them, end over end, oh up four gosh. steps. I have no idea how I didn't kill myself, <laughs> throw out my back or something Wait. terrible, but I get them into the house, put them on furniture sliders and then slide them in position. And that, they're huge. The front sound stage, the 15As and 34C are also enormous. And when they were delivered, the boxes they were delivered in, the JTRs didn't come in boxes, mm -hmm. but the Martin Logans did. And the boxes actually were bigger than the box my refrigerator, oh my, my actual goodness. refrigerator came wow. in. So I sent my wife a picture when they were delivered. 
and I didn't get a response. Yeah. And I know when I don't get a response oh. and it says red, right. I'm just, like, oh, oh no, what have I done? But I didn't really care because at that yeah. point it was, I'm asking for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. I'm already so deep. I'm just going to stay excited. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was just funny seeing these enormous yeah. pieces of equipment next to a 65 inch TV and everything was so tiny. So we got into this new room and I was building everything out. I thought everything was gonna be gonna fit. And the more I was over here, the more I realized it wasn't gonna fit. Mm. So the 34C, if I would have put the JTRs on the floor, would about would have been something like three feet from our seating position, yeah. which is not really where you want a center channel. Sure. It's just not, not it optimal. doesn't sound right. Yeah. It's not optimal, like yeah. you say. So they were gonna lay on their side and it was gonna push the center channel way forward because they're four feet long. So mm -hmm. even if I put them up against the wall, sure. you're pushing my center channel out that far. Then I have to build space between the center channel and the subs, right? Which is, you're losing space there. So it just wasn't gonna work. Well, one of my buddies who helped me design this room was over here looking at it. And I've got these, kind of quirky positions in the front of the room that you can't see. Mm -hmm. But up in the front left, there's an electrical closet. On the front right, there's a staircase. And he was in here when it was bare studs. So he looks at it, it's quiet for a moment, and then says, what if we put the subs in the wall? And I never thought about yeah. taking actual sub boxes sure. and put them in the wall. Because I'm relatively, in the grand scheme of things, I'm relatively new to this yeah. hobby. Yeah. Um, and I never had that idea and he saved this room. That's I mean, awesome. it's, if he hadn't given me that idea, this room would be totally different. Right. I don't think it would be nearly as good as it is now. It wouldn't really, it wouldn't work yeah. because of what the JTRs would, I probably would have had to sell them and I would have eaten a bunch of money and it yeah. just would have been terrible. And that same guy actually helped me with the butt kickers. And the story behind the butt kickers is calls me one day and says, hey, I got an opportunity because he knows I'm, I sell a lot of used stuff, I buy a lot of used stuff. There was a theater closing, the Alamo Draft House, which is here in Kansas City, okay. closed down, Sav salvage company went out, took everything out, and they had posted an ad that said, hey, we've got 200 some odd butt kickers. Oh my goodness. And my buddy calls me and says, do you want to go on halves with me? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what am I going to do with a hundred butt oh, kickers? My goodness, man. So I'm starting to think, and I've resold a lot of stuff. Yeah. And I say, okay, I think this is an opportunity that we can do something. Right. So we go and we buy, I think it was like 230 mm. butt kickers. And these things are, I don't know, yeah, like some the of them size get of really bowling big. balls. Yeah, some of them get really big. So we have 200 and some out of these in the back of his truck. Oh, my They're goodness. stacked. So picture is like a eight foot bed stacked three or four deep right. on top of each other. The entire bed is covered just in butt kickers. Oh, so we come back here and we start to go and we actually sold them all. Um, we had some, we had, he sold his on AVS and I actually did a bunch to the racing okay. and flight sim community, which it was nice because we weren't stepping on each other's toes. Sure. But that also gave me the opportunity to again, overdo my own theater, <laughs> right? So the couch, like I said, yeah. has nine butt kickers in it. Yeah. And the reason it has so many is not only because I like to overdo things, but I feel like having more of them mm -hmm. allows for a more unlocalized shake in the yeah. couch, if sure. you will. So yeah. you're not able to find the epicenter. Like where it's happening. Exactly. Yeah. And it feels feel more it organ it. organic and it feels more like it's coming from the subs. You can turn things down. Totally get it. You don't have the, I don't know if there's distortion Distort with butt sure. kickers, right. but yeah. distortion, if you will. Yeah. Um, so that's the story behind those butt kickers and the subs in the wall. And continuing on the in wall, so the rack in this room, there's a 42U rack sitting next to the left subwoofer and it's back in the wall. So you, you can actually push that rack back to get back because of the, my electrical panels and stuff are back there and you can see the sub and everything. So that's back there and I never thought for my home theater that my 42U rack would be full. Yeah. I mean, I can't put anything else in it. I've got 11 A800s, I've got two QSC, 1102, 
yeah, CX1102s, some power stations, um, and they're not power filtering or anything like mm -hmm. that. They're just like rack mountable power strips. And then the storm audio is up top. There's an NVIDIA shield and some um, network routing and stuff sitting in there. So that provided a good opportunity, but there's a story that goes along with that as well and with the subs. And that story is that when we built this room and my buddy gave me the idea of we're gonna put everything in the wall, I told the guy that was in charge of building the house, kind of the construction manager, mm -hmm. the foreman, or what, I don't know what you would call yeah, it. Sure. But I said, I, I need openings and I need them to be this big. And I specifically said, do not forget to account for the carpet. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, what's gonna happen is, is when I try to slide the subs in and the subs can only go in one way, right. When I try and slide the subs in, they're gonna come in at an angle and I'm gonna hit the top. And guess what they did? Mm. They did not include the carpet in the measurement. So when the mm. movers came down and they were carrying these things like refrigerators right. and we tried to slide them in, they didn't fit. Oh gosh. And then guess what happened with the rack? They didn't account for the carpet either. So mm. when I tried to slide the rack in, it didn't fit. Well, we were able to get the rack in by finagling it and yeah. kind of laying it on its back and sliding it through. But then when I tried to pull it forward, it didn't fit in the opening right. So what do I do in my brand new house? I break out the Sawzall. <laughs> Day one, wow. and I'm ripping apart my theater. Oh, wow. There's sawdust and stuff everywhere just to get yeah. my subs and my rack in the openings that they were supposed to go. I was pissed. <laughs> I mean, I had design this whole thing i'd paid extra because we actually came up with the as this idea after drywall had gone up so we had to have some studs moved and some bracing put in and they don't measure it right mm -hmm. so then since the reason i had to cut it right then instead of waiting for them is the guy that was going to come help me set up the room and put all the speakers up and calibrate and stuff was supposed to come rapidly after we were closing on the house. That's just how the openings have worked out, what his schedule was like. So I didn't have time to wait yeah. for the contractors and I just had to do it. And since I had to do it, I didn't get any refund. So it was, um, it was, a, it was yeah. a bad situation. Sure. It ended but up working out. I did, I tried to paint it and it was, it was kind of one, it was a learning process going through it. Now I've got velvet that comes out like six to eight feet. I tried to paint it initially and rebuild the trim and stuff around it. I wish I would have just done the velvet from the beginning instead of trying to retrim. And it, mm -hmm. it, the reason the trimming was a problem is because when I saw Zald, I was so mad that I was pushing too hard. It just ripped apart the drywall when I was doing wow. things. So the velvet ended up covering everything up. And the velvet's been phenomenal. If anybody's thinking about yeah. building velvet panels and stuff, don't wait. Just do it because the experience that you get from it mm -hmm. is so exponentially better than what you could ever imagine. Yeah. I mean, your perceived contrast increases exponentially yeah. because instead of, and people may think that a flat black paint is great, but yeah. man, when you, gotcha. and you can see it yeah. right here compared yeah, to the flat black, I'm it's like a it. black hole. Yeah, it's like, weird, like that disappears. So what he's yeah. talking about is if you look up here at the front, yeah. On the left is just solid black, and you can't see your subwoofer. You nope. can't see your rack. Nope. On the ceiling, though, you've got, like I said, or you said, like six foot there, eight foot there, mm -hmm. and it's just into the abyss. You can't see anything. I mean, this you see speakers. You see this beautiful image. Well, we'll get We'll get there. there. <laughs> I don't know how beautiful. Maybe beautiful to somebody, but, man, it, it is not it, beautiful to me. I'm an optimist, and I'm a visionary, so I'm thinking of what it's going to be. So, actually, <sighs> let's, let's go ahead and go there. Okay. So, Vid, video, I mean, audio-wise, this is incredible. Thanks. Very, it's been a wild journey. Very tactile base um, because you've got not only big, massive subwoofers, but you've got the base shakers, too. Um, and the base does, so we're on a concrete slab, and there was actually comments tonight that I was not expecting mm -hmm. about how good the base is yeah. on concrete. And I think part of that is the couch mm. um, because it's a wood frame yeah. and everything. I think so part of that is that it's resonating. not a really heavy couch because yeah. people have a tendency to put in, and I don't blame them, yeah. the theater chairs, the I've recliners and sure. stuff. Yeah. I think because this is a little bit lighter, it, the subs do a little bit better. Right. Um, maybe we're becoming airborne. I, I don't know, <laughs> but it works out fairly well. Um, but you're the projector. Good God. <laughs> is it terrible? Is it terrible? Yeah. Um, so we'll let's, 
let's go into that story just a little bit. All right, so when we get here, some of the guys, you know, one thing y'all have a unique opportunity is you have these home theater crawls. Yep. People meet in each other's homes, but you help each other out. Like you said, you... Well, there's attempts. <laughs> <laughs> so we get here and we're looking at it and immediately, nobody wants to critique anybody's... I was critiquing myself. ...home theater. <laughs> but you kind of told us up front, you're like, hey guys, I just want to let you know my projector looks terrible. Garbage. Us, all right, tell us... Tell us what that was so, all about. That was pretty unique. What ended up happening is NZ series from JVC is coming out. Correct. Or it came out. Yeah. When this room was built, I did an NX7 from mm -hmm. JVC, and it was a phenomenal projector. I've got the same projector. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's great projector. Yep. One thing I didn't like about it was bulb deterioration, mm -hmm. right? So you lose some lumens. Sure. So I wanted to go to the NZ series right. that just came those out. Those are lasers. Yep. Yep, so that was announced in September, if I remember correctly, and it was supposed to come out in October. So what do I do? And this is what I typically do, given the used game, and yeah. I've sold a bunch of stuff. I sell my NX7 yeah. because I'm getting ready sure. for the NZ because I want to capitalize on the market and right. make sure I get as much as I can sure. for the NX series. And I did. I got what I wanted out of it. I didn't lose really any money mm -hmm. on the NX7. But then I find out that the NC series gets delayed, delayed yeah. <laughs> and I am without a projector. Now, something that happened, and I don't know if we talked about this earlier, is actually it ended up kind of working out when I sold the NX7 because mm -hmm. I had encountered right. a water leak. Yeah. So what, in, what happened with that is right above this room is the kitchen, yep. and the dishwasher is right there. So this is the kitchen island is right above us. There is a HVAC conduit that runs through the ceiling and then back to a vent in the back that I need still need to paint black. Um, we noticed a water spot up there. Now, mm -hmm. when it happened, we had no idea what was wrong. I call the, because the house is still, it's just over a year old. When the mm -hmm. water leak happened, it was under a year old. My like, guys, I call the builder. I have a water leak in my theater. Yeah. Now, I think we can all appreciate that we don't want a water leak in yeah. somebody's theater. So I had to really emphasize that, you know, we need to get this taken care of. Because mm -hmm. at first they, they were like, well, it's just a water leak. We'll get call a plumber. Well, first off, they didn't want me to call a plumber, right. which I, I didn't crazy. really understand. Yeah. So they came out, he looked at it, he was like, I don't know what this is. Now you can call a plumber. I'm like, what? You told me not to call a plumber. I had a plumber coming, and then you, now I've canceled it. Now you want me to call him again. Now they can't come for a week when they were going to come tomorrow. So now we're waiting. So then I made him come back out because I don't want a water problem in sure. here. I don't want to have a mold problem in my ceiling. Yep. So they get somebody out. They actually cut a hole. They look up there. What was happening is since there's an HVAC line that runs there, the dishwasher drain is so close, and this room gets so cold in when the air conditioner's on that it was causing condensation on the HVAC from the hot water coming by and it was just dripping onto the ceiling. Wow. So they ripped all of the the conduit out and put insulated HVAC ducting up there so we shouldn't have that problem anymore. It shouldn't condensate because it's insulated. Right. Well now we're waiting on paint. But because I had sold the NX7 it ended up working out because they were having to work on the room anyway. So it, for that time period, at least, it, it ended up not being too bad. But after that, I went projector list for like a month. I'm like, this is too long. Yeah. Then the NZ series continued to get delayed. So I got an LG series. And the initial reviews that I had read said that the LG was supposed to be like the Epson 5050 killer. Like, mm -hmm. oh, this is going to be awesome. Yeah. It's a, a good, laser good projector, light. Yeah. It's supposed to be really good. People like the black levels are oh, great. I get it and I hook it up and I turn it on and then I just stare at it. Mm. And after having the NZ, the NX series, mm. I'm wondering how can you look at this and think this is even black? Yeah. This isn't black levels. Yeah. As one of our friends came over during the crawl tonight, he's like, you don't have black levels, you have gray levels. Yeah. Like this doesn't it even was. make it, it to black. It's really obvious. It's really, really obvious. bad. And yeah. there was a point where um, a couple weeks ago, I had some guys out, and somebody brought a, uh, I think it was a, I think it was a 60-50, or mm -hmm. it was a 50-50 or something like that, okay. and we put them side by side. And this is supposed to be the projector that 
the LG is supposed to take down. Like this is what reviews have said. Like this is the new three thousand dollar pinnacle of projector right. awesomeness. This LG. The, this LG. Yeah. <laughs> It was wasn't it? even close. <laughs> it was bad. The Epson it was, was bad. actually brighter. Yeah. Its black levels looked like it was an OLED less next to a terrible LED. Yeah. That's what the black levels looked like. I'm not a video file and I'm Oh, oh my yeah. gosh. It and you can ask obvious. anybody that was here that had these two. It was night and day. So yeah. not only were the black levels terrible, yeah. the out of the box calibration is so bad that the guys that came over tonight immediately when they saw it were like we have to calibrate this. Yeah, they busted this. out, you know, colorimeters. We have and... to spectrometers <laughs> were like we have to fix this. They did. And then they attempted to yeah, fix they, it. That's what I mean. They they busted it out, but <laughs> and they tried. They really They really tried. tried. There was a <clears throat> we tried for like an, an hour, hour and a half yeah. to try and fix this. Yeah. And then you have uniformity issues where it's almost like from the left to the right, there is a different, gradient yeah, that moves across Even it. Even I noticed from top to bottom, oh maybe gosh. one color. Oh my gosh, it is so, <laughs> kind of fades it is another. so bad. And yeah. then on tape, taking it a step further, the iris then does some weird stuff with yeah. colors. You would calibrate it, and then if you change the iris setting, it would just screw up all of the colors. And it was just a disaster. And it got to the point where we just gave up. Like there was nothing we could do. Yeah. And I kept telling the guys, guys, this is temporary. Yeah. I realized exactly. that this is His horrific. Garbage. <laughs> I have to live with it. It right. is getting returned. Right. Yeah. I'm just waiting for the yeah. NZ series to come out. So JVC, get on the ball. Get him in. Please. <laughs> Please. He's ready. He's ready. <laughs> he has suffered enough. Oh my really. gosh. The LG, it, I mean, it's it's a placeholder. It's giving me an image, but man, Epson Killer, it is not. Yeah. It, it it is it is rough. Now the the NZ series, man, that's exciting. I'll be honest with you. I'm looking at it. Yeah. So I've been doing a lot of reviews on the ultra short throw projectors. Mm -hmm. Great part about the laser projectors is you get a long lifespan. You do. Typical bulb, like 3,000 maybe? Well, this 4, is a laser, maybe. and it's not doing too well. Uh, well but, yeah. It, but it's... But, but I mean, like, going from your NX7 oh, is where sure. I Oh, for mean, sure. To yeah. be able to go to the... N, are you doing the NZ9? I think I'm doing the NZ8. Okay, yeah. so that's the middle one. So, oh my goodness. I'm excited about that, but it's it's pricey. I'm, I've noticed when I got the N, NX7 that I, I'm perceptible or can perceive bulb fade yeah. pretty easily, okay. and I don't like it. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say that I'm a, a video snob. Yeah, I just, not. it bothers me, because now I'm thinking, this doesn't look right. Like, I, it just, it's always in the back of your head. Like, I know how this projector should look, sure. and it's slowly deteriorating, and it, I don't like that. Yeah. So, the fact that JVC has brought out a laser, and it's got a 20,000 some odd hour yeah. bulb oh, life goodness. is phenomenal. That's now, incredible. that's probably in eco mode, it's not in high mode, but even 10,000 hours or whatever, I'll that's take phenomenal. Take that would take me years. <laughs> that projector will be yeah. sold long before I even come close <laughs> yeah. to that. Yeah. Because something invariably, I mean, I'm the type that wants sure. to, I'm gonna wanna sell it eventually, mm -hmm. and that's how it is. So yeah. uh, it'll get sold, sure. um, but I'm really excited about that. I'm, they keep delaying it, yeah. and I'm talking to the uh, the guy I'm trying to get one from. Is like my distributors we'll are try, telling yeah. me one thing, yeah. but we don't have an idea, so sure. I'm, I'm anxiously awaiting well, because I'm this thing for needs you, to go. I would love to have one in my home theater. Absolutely. Do you want this? No. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. I like great youth man deals, but I'll pass on that. I'll pass on that one. So kind of thinking about your your home theater, okay? Mm -hmm. So you've had this a while now. You've been able to live in it. You've been able to use it. Yep. You've had guests over. If you could back up to day one mm -hmm. and redo it from scratch, <clears throat> is there anything that you'd change? I know like in my theater, there's some things I look back and go, man, if I had this or if I could have done this, like what would you change? I wouldn't would get rid of the NX7. Okay. <laughs> hang on to that. Well, I would hang on to yeah. it till the NZ. But I mean, like size of your, like how big, so is, how the, big is your room? The room is just under 15 feet wide. Okay, right. It's 30, around 30 feet long. Mm -hmm. So it's not an enormous room. It's eight feet tall ceilings. And then the box vault here in the middle is nine feet. Right. Uh, so it's not a now, huge room. Now, do you room. feel that's like 
adequate for your needs? Is it? I like is the it shape wide of the room. Or deep enough. I think it's big enough. Height enough. Yeah. So I'm not trying to build. I I didn't set out to entertain mm-hmm. an arsenal of people at any given time. I'm yeah. not. I don't need a 20 seat theater. The sure. people that are majority of the time are going to be my wife and I or yeah. just me. A lot and of that's times why it's you just got this me. cool little couch here. And it's I, just you and your family. And I told the guys over here when they were talking about spot spots because mm-hmm. something that maybe people don't know is the Martin Logans, the electrostatics especially, are enormously, um, how can I put this? They are, they have very small disper- dispersions. They are very focused. So really the best place in the, in the house is this seat. Now a lot of theaters, that is the best spot. Sure. But since everything is so focused, mm-hmm. once you start moving on this couch, the soundscape and the experience changes. Right. And it's not hugely negative, but you can move your head around and sure. you can tell that things are definitely imaging different. Changes the imaging a changes sure. a little bit. Is it enough to you know worry about it? No. But you definitely want to want to be in this mm-hmm. in this spot. So, so big question. Mm-hmm. Where do you sit? Obviously here. <laughs> Life over here, kids over here, dogs down there. Uh, dogs aren't allowed in here. <laughs> oh, okay. So three Siberian Huskies, like we talked about, the hair would be out of control. Oh, they're beautiful. Uh, the the question was broached: Is I have velvet up on the front? Why don't I have velvet on the floor? Well, velvet come not velvet hair coming down on clothing. Yeah. We have enough hair that it would eventually yeah, settle like on, on your, the floor. On the of your oh socks my gosh! And, bring it in here and velvet, stuff. unfortunately, doesn't vacuum very well, and it yeah. would just get destroyed. Yeah, it'd just be so. Hard. Yeah, that's that's definitely my spot now. My wife and I, we, the nice thing about having a couch over over theater, theater seating seat, sure. is that it provides more of a intimate yeah. viewing experience. I mean, mm-hmm. you don't have armrests or anything, yeah. which is something that I wanted. I wanted to be able to sprawl out if I was watching by myself. You know, cuddling is part sure. of it. Yeah. Um, theater seats are great. I mean, when I sit in them, I'm like, oh, this is nice, right. but. I like my couch. It, it is individualistic on a theater yes. seat. It's like, okay, yes. this is my space. Don't get in it. Yeah, this is my you, bubble. Get you, out of it. You can't cross <laughs> over. So I get that. I get yeah, that. So I like the couch. There are times when I regret the couch. Mm-hmm. Um, I like the table. There are times that I regret the table because yeah. we're talking about things that I made This works I great, made change. though. It because, does. I mean, we had a group back here with mm-hmm. laptops mm-hmm. calibrating and checking emails and then you know, we can put our drinks up here, mm-hmm. which is cool. I may so. have liked it to be shorter. Okay. I don't know how much this is impacting the sound. I was wondering about that. But because you've got surround speakers back here. And I so think they're tall enough that it fires over the top of it. So gotcha. I'm not hugely worried about that. That mm-hmm. may be something that I would think about. Mm-hmm. One of the problems with it, though, is I'd like to do a, a couple near field or one near field sub. But there's a bar that runs underneath this table. So it's not really conducive for a near field sub. Yeah. So that's kind of a regret. Um, I don't remember if we talked about the kitchen in the back. The kitchen's great. I like having the refrigerator. Yeah. Now, Very there, is a, there is a problem with it. So initially when we had this room, there was a microwave back there. Okay. And I don't think we talked about this at now, all. That would cause a hum, right? No, not okay. the hum. Okay. The hum isn't the problem. I've seen that in, no, in the hum situations. isn't the problem. Okay. The hum is the, the problem is the subs. And there was a problem where the microwave was vibrating off of the counter. No way. <laughs> so oh there was a goodness. time when I was watching Dread in the opening season part of Dread, and yeah. I look back, and the microwave is halfway off of the counter. Oh my goodness. So the microwave has since left right. back Put there. Put back up there. Yeah, so the, one of the other problems is the cabinets and stuff that are back there. I think in Blade Runner 2049, you guys probably heard it. Phenomenal. They shake, and I need to go back there with some sound deadening and fix it. Um, so it's, I like having it back there. There is a problem. I've got some tile that's back there and it's creating this kind of like sub hot zone because the sound gets back there and it just bounces yeah, around. It's it kind of boomy yeah. in your, your back area. Yeah, so I've, I've got some absorption mm-hmm. around the theater. I don't have any back there. Why when I made these panels? Because I they're just made of like one by twos yeah. and... Um, Oh, uh, what's it called? Or, rock wool. Okay. They've got rock wool in them, which rock wool is awesome for that. It's also awesome to shove up in your lights because it's fire resistant yeah. um, and you don't have to worry about it heating up and sure. it's a sound deadening, so it stops things nice. from vibrating. That's a cool little tip. Yeah, so there's uh, safe and sound rock wool. Evidently, I did not put enough in the back ones because we were watching things. They were actually falling out. Oh, man. So <laughs> I was sitting back there laughing because these guys, up. these guys are enjoying the soundscape, <laughs> and I'm back there holding up my lights. <laughs> so that was the the tile. I 
after this crawl next week, I'm going to break everything back out. I need to go get some more fabric. I'm going to build some masks because one thing we noticed yesterday at the theater we were at is he had some masks, yeah. which I had thought about. One of the theaters we're going to see, I think, Sun Sunday mm -hmm. has, no, it's Monday. He has masks and I had I've seen his and theater. we're talking about masking for the yeah, screen? Yeah, masking okay. the screen, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. He has it on his theater, and I thought about it, but I never really went down, and I think it was because of the NX-7. Yeah. The LG <laughs> has opening my, opened my eyes. Yeah. And I like, think oh, even I with the JVC's sure. dark blacks, yeah. you're going to benefit from black. that. That's for sure. Um, and having the velvet that I have up in the front in this yeah. perceived this black hole, sure. the perceived contrast that you get, a projector's not OLED level black, right? Absolutely. It doesn't actually Absolutely. turn off. It's still some sort of grayish, blackish thing. Sure. It's it's dim, but you can see right. It. And with when it's next to the velvet, yeah. it is no longer black. Like you can tell yeah. that this is no not black anymore, and it's much more difficult to see when you don't have the velvet there. All right. So now that I've got it in the LG, you can tell. And I think even with the JVC, you could tell. Mm -hmm. So building masking panels what while I'm building some more observers isn't a problem. Sure. Um, and the, for anybody use, that's- Use magnets to maybe- Yeah, yeah. Cause the, it's just, a, so it's just a silver ticket screen. It was like 200 bucks on Amazon. It's mm -hmm. still an alumina or a metal frame. Yeah. So even if I don't, magnets don't work, I don't think magnets work on aluminum. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll figure something out even gotcha. if I have to Velcro and build them bigger mm -hmm. and they, I can just Velcro them on. Sure. That's not necessarily a problem. I'll a figure something way. out. Yeah, a lot of great ways and yeah. DIY ways that you can do it without having to buy electronic masks. And I think people overestimate how difficult some of this stuff is. Like building, I know some people may not have the tools. Yeah. But you can do a lot of this with hand tools. Like yeah. these absorbers, they're literally one by twos. Yeah frame right. that I nailed together. They've got one cross member because when you, I learned that when you stretch the fabric over, it has a tendency to pull, pull the wood in. in sure. So you want a cross member in there so it stops it. And they're just stapled on the back. The yeah. one suggestion that I would make is make sure you have an air compressor and you have a pneumatic stapler because mm -hmm. you hate yourself if it's just a, the squeeze. a manual <laughs> one. Because I've, I've read the counts of like, yeah. I will never do this again. Yeah. But I had a pneumatic stapler and it made it really easy. So it's duck cloth over top of, um, Safe and sound, yeah. and it's they done great, yeah. And they measured well. And you can tell when you clap in this room when we were calibrating it and stuff. Um, Storm Audio came out, we talked, he did a phenomenal job in calibrating this room. So, the room yeah. with the storm that's in the rack, it's a storm ISP Mark II, runs on Dirac. And when I had done this room initially, and I know we're kind of getting away from we can get back to that. Um, when I did my room initially, I didn't do any of the EQ because I don't know how to do that. Like yeah. I, I have an idea. I have an idea about what to do with EQ, so on and so forth, but I'm not I don't have the knowledge to be able to do that very mm -hmm. well. So I did Dirac from the just let it do its thing and I didn't yeah. change anything. And it sounded decent. Mm -hmm. There was a problem where this is just things you don't notice because there's there's so much sound going yeah. on in a room that you, a lot of times you don't notice mistakes. Sure. So <laughs> one of the sets of Atmos or height speakers was reversed. So gotcha. my center right. was actually playing the rear like the height rear and the rear was mm. the center. That speaker was actually off. Oh wow. Like it wasn't even plugged in. So the sub was active, gotcha. but the electrostatic panel wasn't on. Okay. And I had... I attribute this to me not noticing because I think people don't realize how little content your surround yeah. speakers actually play. Sure. And there's so little that I didn't realize that that actually wasn't even on. Yeah. And plus you've got another one behind it or next yeah. to it that yeah. it's kind of filling so in So having 11 too. bed layer, it's, you don't necessarily <laughs> know, but it, it, yeah. we found it because yeah. when we were trying to calibrate... Like, why isn't it, yeah. it noise coming out of yeah. that? And it was because of the electric. And I think we can all relate to things like that. Oh, you know, yeah. We, we've hooked up, up backwards or sometimes I've pulled my cabinet out and one of my channels has yeah. come unplugged. And I'm like, I didn't notice it till I climb back in there the next time. Yeah. I'm like, oh, shoot, I, I've been watching movies and maybe my top surround isn't even plugged right. in because a banana plug got 
kind of loose and just popped out. So what ended up happening, and the reason they were off, for people that don't know, is that electrostatics are active speakers, right? They have to be plugged into an outlet because the panel has to be charged. Yeah. And if it's not, it doesn't work. So there's outlets behind all of these speakers. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was a problem. Another problem, and this is just stuff that I, I will frankly admit because yeah. it, it's part of the journey. Yeah, that, and if you don't us, embrace yeah. the mistakes, yep. you're never going to learn and you're bound to repeat them. So one of the other problems was my right sub was out of phase. And we realized this because when we were doing the measurements at something like 40 hertz, there was this massive 40 dB or something whole. Yeah. Just there was nothing there. Sure. And it was fixed by just changing the phase Correct. and it was flat and it was amazing that you think you have this great room yeah. but you don't know it sounds good because you're hearing bass yeah you just don't know you're missing that section you don't know bass. what you don't know <laughs> exactly. is the best way to put it yeah. and now i know because the room sounds infinitely yeah. better i mean sure. having storm out here it was just incredible because he did the he was actually eqing before he did direct did Dirac mm -hmm. and then EQ'd again. Gotcha. So we use Dirac to do a lot of it because it it's perceptible to do things that sure. we can't necessarily hear, but then tweaking things. So electrostatics inherently are a little bit bright in my mm -hmm. opinion. Yeah. And they can very be a little detailed, but I they love can be the a little bit harsh. Them. Yeah, they are. I enjoyed the detail. Yeah, they're I really do. very detailed and they're very fast because they don't have a moving sure. um like mass. a driver. Yeah. I mean they still move, they just sure. move their the film Thin and membrane stuff. membrane yeah. or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. So he EQ'd out a little bit of that harshness, but something we realized is if you take too much of it out, mm -hmm. you lose a lot of the emotion. Yeah. Because, and we were listening to one of the songs and it was harsh, but I think it was harsh because it was almost like a, I'm going to say screech, mm -hmm. but think about somebody that is so sad yeah. and they're almost crying, yelling, and think about how that sounds put that into music and somebody singing, it's mm -hmm. gonna sound a little harsh, yeah. but it conveys the emotion with it. Gotcha. So taking all of that out hurt what we were hearing and how we were experiencing it. So we actually put some of that harshness back in. Mm -hmm. We took some of it out because it felt a it little, over, a little bit, yeah. overwhelming, but we there was still a ton there and it was kind of an eye-opening yeah. experience for both of us realizing that, man, Yes, if we listen to this song over and over, I would fatigue, but I wouldn't get the same emotions listening to it that I'm getting because that harshness exists. Um, so those kind of were a couple mistakes. Um, <laughs> that vent at one point when I first moved into this room fell out when I was listening it's to It's kind of hanging on now a little bit. <laughs> I had to remodify. It's actually, it's hanging out because I have some sound deadening. It was vibrating so much it fell off. Um, so that was... That was kind of a, a mistake. I wish I thought about this stuff when I was building the room. Hey, hey maybe put the HVAC somewhere else and not like smack dab in the middle right. of my room. Um, trying to think if there's anything else that I really regret. Uh, not making sure that my subs would fit was probably another one. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't really have too many regrets about this room. It's all... Well, I can see why. Because, I mean, this room literally... Like I said, we've spent hours from yeah. 4 p.m., so probably about 10, 30 Okay, I do have one. I do have one. And this is something that I saw this morning at our last one. Mm -hmm. I wish the room was taller. Okay. So uh, yeah. when the foundation was poured, I wish I would have said, hey, dig this part of the basement like two feet deeper. Mm -hmm. Give me steps coming in so that I would get 10-foot ceilings instead of 8-foot ceilings yeah. because I'm 6'5". Yeah. My speaker's Tall. hanging from the ceiling. I have to warn anybody that's over six feet, you're going to smack your head on them. <laughs> we had several Poor people God. do it. Yes. It seems like everybody up here is tall, too. I mean, yeah, you guys are we're, way we're over six foot. Big crew, but yeah. one of the guys did smack his heads, and I had to come back in with my toolkit <laughs> to tighten it down. He's got um, the, the, the wrench uh, yeah, socket we took set him right out. there. Yeah. We took him out, but I did have to tighten it back down. Yeah. Um, so I do. that is one that I wish it was deeper. I yeah. maybe wish that I suspended my garage and put the theater under there. You know, in the grand scheme of things... Hindsight's always twenty yeah, twenty. Sure. It's always going to be, be a, have been a wish I would have done this. Yeah. I could have done this. Well, you just kind of got to embrace what you've got, enjoy yeah. it instead of always Absolutely. hating or regretting the things that you've yeah. done. So, and I've always tried to encourage you guys that 
you know, use the space that you have. Yeah. If you've got a bedroom and that's all you've got to work with and you want to make a, a theater room out of it, make it. Yep. If you've got a garage, if you've got a, a, a bonus room, whatever, you know, when I bought our home, it had a 13 foot by 19 foot dedicated, or not a dedicated, but it was a media room. So it was just a empty room, no mm -hmm. closet. And my vision was to have like a 15 by 25. So it was going to be wider, it's going to be deeper. But you know what? I look back and what I would rather have a longer and wider, sure. But I still am grateful that I've got what I've got and yep. I enjoy yep. it. My family enjoys it. And I think that's just what you have. You just have to be careful that you don't whack your yeah. head on those corners. Man. Yeah. So I've gotten used to ducking and, yeah. and stuff like that. But it is it is what it is. I've embraced it. Um, there, right. there are some stuff where I wish I would have done the velvet from the mm -hmm. beginning. But it, it's again, it's a learning experience. Yeah. It's you just kind of got to go with it. And then instead of going back and hating yourself or regretting what you do, try and impart that knowledge, what you've learned on other people. Yeah. So they're, they're not having to reinvent the wheel and make the same mistakes yeah. and then allow them to experience a better room. I mean, hopefully you're not somebody that wants that doesn't want somebody to have that. And you're like yeah. withholding information, <laughs> but, uh, it, it's always, a, it's always a good time. I, I, Another piece of advice that I will say and something that has been amazing in this room, and it's actually been a huge help to my wife, is integrating Siri into this room. Mm -hmm. So I have, I think I said earlier, I have 11 A800s. There's two CX1102s, the mm -hmm. Storm, the NVIDIA Shield, the projector, the lights, right. all that stuff. There's on. a lot, and there's a lot of switches. If you, you would have had to take the velvet off to push all these buttons, right. light switches, it's inherently dark. <clears throat> so something I decided to do, and what we've done in the house when we moved in, was incorporate voice control into things. Sure. The lights in the house are on voice, and sure. a big people are, again, are going to think this is maybe harder than it actually is. So... To get voice control is you find light switches that you like, mm -hmm. whatever, Alexa, Google, yeah. HomeKit, RTI, if you don't want to pay somebody to do it. Sure. Then you incorporate them into it. There's a million different yeah. routes you can go. So I brought that into the theater. And how I did that was all of the amps plug into a rack-mounted power strip. That mm -hmm. power strip, there's three zones. So I've got my fronts. And there's two that control the Atmos and the rears. Right. Um, so I can tell voice control to set pre-show, and then she'll turn on the house lights, set all the blue lights that are on around, turn on the projector, turn on the storm, turn on the NVIDIA shield. And I can do that when I'm coming downstairs. Right. And it's it wasn't overly expensive to do. I mean, I think my total investment was like 100 and something bucks mm -hmm. to do it all because the plugs are cheap if you sure. get them on sale. Um, it's a home pod that I use to interface with Siri. And they sh when I walk into the theater from upstairs, because I know I'm coming down to do right. something, it's ready to go. I don't have to wait for anything to warm up. Nice. Then I go through, pick a movie. Then I tell her it's movie time. She turns on the other amps. She turns off all the lights. I don't have to do anything. Yeah. So now I, it, lights are on while we're picking stuff, getting situated. It's movie time. We've picked something. Lights come off. Then when we're done... We get up, we walk out, and I tell her, hey, show's over, and she turns everything off. That's so awesome. it, it just simplifies the whole process because I think that's another problem that people run into is things can get so overly complex sure. that Make it becomes it almost uh, exhausting yeah. to turn it on, and you become dissuaded from wanting to interact with it. And if you can make it simple, you actually want to do it more because you don't have to worry about anything. It becomes more of a fun experience instead of thinking, man, I have to turn all this on. My wife hated it. Yeah. She's like, I don't know how to turn any of this on. And now she can just talk to her and now it's ready to go. Good. And it's, if you want your wife to experience something or your significant other, maybe I shouldn't just say wife, yeah. um, significant other to experience this with you. And they maybe don't have the same degree of technicality as make you do. Or, yeah. Just make it easy. And she loves coming down here now. I mean, it's, there's times where I'm out and she, I call her and she's like, I'm just in the theater watching something, awesome. doing something. And it's that's rewarding too because now I know that she enjoys it, I enjoy it, she appreciates it. And that just brings a whole nother level of happiness and joy to this whole hobby. So it's 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 been a great journey. I'm glad I did it. There's regrets. There's always going to be regrets. But at the end of the day, I've got it. Might as well enjoy it. And it's been a great ride.
So Ryan, you mentioned that you've got Siri kind of yep. integrated into your home theater and it's controlling a lot of things. And you mentioned kind of some parts of your rack, but mm -hmm. maybe kind of walk us through. So you've got it behind this black velvet so we don't yep. see it. Yep. You can remove that panel. Once you remove that panel, what are we looking at in the rack? So back there is a 42U rack, um, bunch of separate amps. So we initially, and this is something I think people will be interested in. When I first started this journey, when I bought, well, not when I first started the journey, but when I bought my 15As, the mm -hmm. big boys, yeah. um, I was kind of ignorant about what was going on. I've learned a lot over the past like two years. I mean, sure. it has been yeah. just a whirlwind of moving in this direction and doing the level of what I've done in the theater. I wanted to do it right. I read a lot. I've done a lot. Um, I kind of got myself into trouble because there's a lot of subjectivity that's involved in this hobby. There's a lot of, I'll call it snake oil that's yeah. involved in this hobby. Sure. And I, I don't mean to say, uh, I won't say what amps they were, mm -hmm. but I, I bought some amps that weren't necessarily required for my setup. Okay. They were vastly overpriced. They were more of like a... Kind of boutique, a Boutique, maybe? Okay. you know, you're... you're doing it for the look and mm -hmm. stuff and they were like four grand a piece they were Yikes, mono blocks yeah. wow and i was told that i needed them because i didn't know any better and yeah. i i, I should have because i investigate <laughs> the hell out of anything right. but i think i was so excited to do this and i just said yes let's do it um Unfortunately, I was one of those like blank check people. Yeah. And, and just make it happen. Let's, let's do this. Let's have some fun. <laughs> yeah. We're ready to get a show. So I road. got these, and the guy said, you need tons of power for your electrostatics. And for anybody that doesn't know, the big guys, the reason you need a ton of power is what I found out. And even with these amps that this guy said were enough, mm -hmm. when you get above a certain point, let's say you're getting close to reference, which a lot of manufacturers say oh don't do this and when i talked to martin logan about this problem like oh my god you're listening way too loud you need to not do that like, i know how loud this is right but how loud it was what was happening is above a certain frequency the ohms were dropping to under half an ohm yeah, and it was causing a, a virtual load. short yeah. in the amps so what was happening even with these four thousand dollar mono blocks is they were going into protection. And I didn't realize it at the time. I thought it was actually my subs mm -hmm. overdriving a circuit in my house and it was causing right, some type tripping. of like feedback or yeah. tripping something and that was causing them to go into project protection. I didn't think it was the, the towers. Right. How could that happen? This guy must have been right. Sure. Whatever. So moving on from that, I realized that after more knowledge and learning and stuff that these amps probably weren't right. Mm -hmm. So... In my old house, a bunch of guys came over and we broached this topic about the crawls in Kansas City and people coming together. Something we did was an AB blind test with amps. And I was trying to find, I used this test to try and figure out what direction I wanted to go. I had some ideas. I was pretty sure I wanted to go solid, solid state, like class D. Mm -hmm. And we took a bunch of amps and did a blind AB test to them. I even went so far as to take Benchmark out of New York, which is Benchmark Amps, which at the time, and maybe they still are, was the current leader on Audio Science Review for amps. Like right. it was the amp to have. Right. Yeah. And I had one come in, compared it to the Behringer A800, yeah. which at the time was like a 200 and something dollar sure. two channel bud, amp. Budget friendly. Is, yeah. And then we had a, um, I think we had a QSC, there was some other um, Crown, and then I think there was a Rotel, there okay. was another one, and we, so we did this amps. blind A-B yeah. test, right? So we had my wife come in and wire them to this control board, and then we covered it. So okay. we couldn't tell what amp was on what, nice. what switch. Yeah. And we were switching them back and forth, and we swore that there was a difference. And we were pointing at stuff, and what was what, and then we gave the control board to one guy, and he put it under a jacket, so we couldn't see it. And he started flipping things back and forth, and we thought... <clears throat> Oh man, I can tell which one's which. Mm -hmm. it guy was, was jacked up, wasn't it? Guy was flipping the same amp on and oh, off. Oh wow! And y'all were changing your mind. Yes. On, wow. And it was the same amp. Yeah. <laughs> so that really said, mm -hmm. man, this is all subjectivity. Like, I can't tell. I've got the best amp supposedly in the world here, sure. and I can't tell what's what. Now, could part of that have been that we were doing it on my electrostats? Maybe because the electrostatics aren't the sensitive, the most sensitive speakers. I think they are advertised as like 87 or 89 okay. dB. Real world, they're probably lower sure. than that. 
if we put it on something like a JTR, which is like ultra sensitive, would you notice? Maybe. Yeah. But in my room, because it's all electrostatics, if I can't hear it, right. why am I paying the money for it? So originally I went with Behringer A800s. I have 11 of them. Right. And I did that because it was the most cost effective thing to do. I couldn't find amps that had enough channels mm -hmm. that would also drive my front. So everything in this room was on minus the subs and the right. buck kickers didn't exist at that point was on these A800s. Well, then I again encountered the problem with my amps going into protection. Right. And I called Martin Logan, and this is when they told me that Ohm's problem boarding on the short. Gotcha. Like you're going, you're too loud, and you're pushing your amps too hard, and they're going into protection. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, how can I fix this? Well, then I went big and went QSC CX1102, so I've got... I don't know, Lots over 1,500 watts per channel. <laughs> and guess what? I can still push them into protection. Nice. It's way louder than I'd ever want to be, and I pushed it just to see if it would happen, yeah. and it did. So these speakers drive the ever-living crap out of my amps. And that's, people may think, oh, you can never utilize whatever an amp's doing in home theater, or whatever. Yes, you can. Yeah. And when you start applying EQ, and it's very situational on on the speaker like if you get into a jtr or something you're never going to use that much because you don't need to because they're sure. ultra sensitive right. but when you start getting into the sensitivities and the ohm loads and stuff that my martin logan the big towers are putting on the little guys aren't yeah. but the big ones are putting on their on their amps you have to have that tremendous amount sure. of power so the rack going back to it consists of 11 behringer 800s um, the ones that I pulled off for the center channels are now running the butt kickers. You got the two QSC CX 1102s. All of those are plugged into rack mounted power strips. Those power strips then plug into Wi Fi connected, I don't know what else, the plugs, yeah, I guess, that, that I've that, run yeah. into Homebridge. Mm -hmm. And Homebridge takes a non HomeKit compliant, HomeKit is Apple's like automation mm -hmm. system, right. ecosystem. Homebridge allows non-HomeKit compliant devices to interface with HomeKit and people design, it's open source, and people design plugins to take these non-HomeKit compliant plugin or pieces of equipment and bring them into HomeKit. Sure. So these plugs were cheap and I've got them on an Internet of Things network so they're not talking to anything else. So, because they do talk, something we realized with a light strip that I've since taken out of the couch, it was making some internet calls like 27,000 oh, times wow. a day, something crazy. So it's, you know, be careful with what you put on your network. Mm -hmm. Things can be doing things that you may not realize they are, and I'm not trying to create a hysteria. Or sure. just, just be careful. Yeah. I, we, we won't go any further than that. So those are all plugged into that, and that allows me, we talked about this previously, to... Um, tell Siri to turn things on and I can do it with zone. So right. all three of certain blocks of those Wi-Fi plugs are configured together so that they turn on at certain points. And then the storm audio, there's an NVIDIA shield, which does all of my streaming. Um, and it also, most of my movies are on a Plex server. So I've got a 60 terabyte Plex server back there that we bring in. There's like 1500 4k lossless movies <clears throat> that I utilize and do. And then a harmony hub, interfaces with Siri to control mm -hmm. everything in the room. Nice. Um, and then that's that's really how everything works. And that's hidden behind the velvet. And when I need to get to the back of it, we just push your back and everything's back there. And it's nicely hidden back there. And it actually vents really well. There's a fan on top of the rack and it pulls air in. And then there is a HVAC ducting back in there that just sucks everything mm -hmm. out. Nice. And that's it. So it breathes quite well. The Class D amps actually stay quite cool. I don't have to worry about anything like a Class A. Those Class A's got hot, yeah, man. Sure. I mean, I could sure. I could heat up my entire living room just with those Class A's being on. It yeah. was ridiculous. And something else that I didn't like about them is when you're dealing with heat and things being on for a period of time, right, the sound characteristic can actually change. And these amps were hybrid amps. So they had tubes in them. So that made it even worse mm -hmm. because tubes inherently affect audio, not fidelity, but the sound that you're perceiving right. because it's in the sound chain, in the path that it's going through. So the Class Ds stay really cool. I don't have to worry about it. And talking to the Storm guys, 
um, he used to work at Wisdom, and he was saying, man, when we were doing stuff, just to make sure we didn't have to worry about that, our amps would have to be on for two hours wow. to make sure that we were getting everything how it was supposed to be, and we weren't encountering any of that change from right, heat sure. and things, because heat changes how things operate. I mean, you're changing um, the how things move through it. I mean, even if you just think about how... Um, heat in weather behaves. I mean, mm -hmm. how it feels, how humidity behaves now encompass electricity and how it's not a lot, but it's enough to impart something. Sure. So that's, I wanted to get away from that and just make things as easy as possible with Siri and all of that. And just, again, easy means you're going to utilize it more a lot of times because it's less fatiguing and it has made a world of difference. Because When we first came in here, it was it was a nightmare to turn it. I'd walk over there, push all the buttons, turn right. everything on. And it was like I was a monkey trying to turn. I looked like this, <laughs> turning everything on. And now I just say, hey, set pre-show. And she does everything. She and does it's everything. awesome. I, I have no regrets. If anybody has is even thinking about it, do it. And I another reason why I went down this road, and then we'll get off this topic, is my Huskies at my old house have a fetish for remotes. They will find a remote, and yes, they're not allowed downstairs, but they will find a remote, and they will destroy it. Mm. It'll be in a million pieces. I went through multiple remotes for my OLEDs, for my Marantz projector, or my Marantz processor that I had before the storm, and it was just a nightmare. So now, everything's on our phones, even for the TVs upstairs. Siri turns everything on nice. when I need it, and it just makes it so much more approachable and so much easier to use because now instead of having five remotes, sure. it's a voice command. You just tell them. Yep, yep. And my it's wife was fun. thinking, I will never use this. And then I'll come downstairs and she's talking to Siri. I'm like, ah, I told gotcha. you. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Michael, we've made it to my thoughts on this whole video and my theater and all of this, but I feel like it's it's been a lot about me. So mm -hmm. I, I want to turn this around. <laughs> and I don't know if this is something that you've done before, but what are your impressions on what you've seen what do you think because part of this experience we talked about this earlier is doing it with others sure and also part of that is i'm bringing people over because i want to know what i can do better and i think that's part of the enthusiast experience so sure. what are let's go through a couple different things what do you like about the room what don't you like about the room um what would you change stuff like that but let's yeah. start with maybe your first impressions yeah. when you came in, what what were your thoughts? So the first thing, honestly, and a lot of people, when they come over to my theater room, they kind of say the same thing, is, you know, you sent me some pictures ahead of time, so I had a, right. a, a visual of what was going on, but when you first walk in it, it seems small. Yeah. You know? because And I think part of that is because the ceilings are eight feet, mm -hmm. and then you've got your speakers hanging down from that, so it's like, <laughs> all right, it's starting to encroach on me. Right. But the cool thing is the sound is not small, and it's not because of just your size of your speakers. It's you've got this complete kind of immersiveness, man. It's, <laughs> it just kind of wraps around you. And I never would have thought to put six Atmos speakers in a room this size. Like I thought, okay, you need to use that for two rows or three rows of seating. I've got two rows, mm -hmm. and in my brain, I'm thinking, I, I, I definitely don't need six atmospheres. I'm like, dude, that's... But it, like I said, it was completely immersive. It's like this massive bubble. Right. And I definitely enjoyed that. And of course, you know, I love bass, and you guys know I love bass. Um, so the dual captivator... Oh my goodness, um, 4,000 ULF. There's a ton of bass there, but one common theme I've even seen just over your home theater and um, the two other gentlemen that I've had a chance, the gentleman I'm staying with, as well as Bruce's home theater. Uh, well, no, Bruce didn't have the, the butt kickers, but I'm starting to like these butt kickers. <laughs> and, and like you said, I think... I got think, some extras. <laughs> oh, man, don't, <laughs> don't tempt me. So here's the thing, it's like... Um, with the butt kickers, I think with anything, you can overdo something. Uh, you can have your subwoofers turned up too loud. You can mm -hmm. have the butt kickers turned up too loud. But I think dialing those in, and I, I, I like what you said about spreading out the, 
the, the tactile base through this by adding multiple, because I feel the same way about subwoofers. You know, if you just have one subwoofer, it, it, especially if you got it turned up too loud, then you're definitely going to localize that subwoofer. You're gonna hear like where that's at. And ideally, I've always said, the only time you should notice your subwoofer is when you turn it off. It should blend into yeah. the, the sound of the room that should feel like, okay, that's coming from the, the front sound stage, regardless of where it's physically at in your room. And by having multiple speakers or multiple subwoofers, you spread out that, you know, some people look and say, why would anybody in their right mind ever want to have like four subwoofers? That's crazy. That's overkill. A lot of people say that. My thought is, all right, if you have a single 15 inch driver and you want to feel it in your chest, mm -hmm. you got to crank that thing up pretty stinking loud. I'd agree. And it's working hard and it's like kind of at max capacity. But what if you were to, to add a second or a third or even a fourth? Now all four of those are carrying the load of that pressure. They're running a lot lower volume wise, uh, gain wise. Um, they're having to work less. Same thing with amplifiers. If you have more amplification than you need, you've got headroom. And so you don't worry about running into clipping. And so having all that horsepower, somebody's like, um, couldn't you have just done like a monolith or a couple of monolith amplifiers, a couple of seven? You could. Or, yeah, you can. And I and, did, and, but and they've been have, sold. Yeah, you might have been okay. But the reality is you will never run out of power. You will never run out of you know, when there's quiet scenes and then it just all of a sudden, just massive explosion. You've got all the horsepower needed. And I've always told people that just because you have the horsepower doesn't mean that you got your foot on the gas the whole time. Sure. But the times that you want to experience that rush, it's there. It's, you know, and so I think just implementation, I think you've done a phenomenal job I love the whole, like what you call the black hole. Black hole of velvet. I love seeing that because it literally, your attention goes straight to the screen, even though that wasn't <laughs> that impressive. <laughs> In an unfortunate capacity when, sometimes. When you get the, the NZ8, uh, that's going to be gorgeous, and all of that just disappears. Right. So that, I think, is incredibly smart. I love how you incorporated the LED lights with your Martin Logans. That was pretty cool. Um, there's just some LED strips on the back, and of course, that's controlled, yep. and you can change colors. And... and and I think that's a point of don't underestimate what the little things can do yeah. to a room. And I did those after some people had come through my room, and it, I think it's added a lot. It was very I simple, it. and it was very cheap. I love it. And a lot of guys, they're like, oh, I don't like LEDs. Why would you want LEDs? Because when you watch a movie, well, duh, we turn them off Absolutely. when we yeah. watch a movie. But when we're chilling here, I, I noticed one thing that you did. We were listening to some two-channel music. We're just chilling, vibing, and you went in the back, and you're like, T -t -t -t. and it's like, boop, lights come on. It just pro and like, provides a uh, nice ambiance it was. of it what's was so going cool. on. Yeah, and you know, it provided some ambient light in the room, so it's not just super black. But even just those little things like that, it adds to the decor and it creates a vibe in your room. Honestly, I think it really. Um, and this, you know, I'm, I'm a guy that likes theater seats. Mm -hmm. And so when I see this, I'm like, oh, a couch. This was super comfy. It's, it's different. This was, it's, this was really cool. Man. Not everybody rocks the couch, yeah. but it was, my wife didn't want theater seatings. This is where we ended up. Trust me. My wife wants me to go to a sectional. I'm it's like, babe, we're not doing a sectional. In the... Well, maybe we've changed your mind. We'll, we'll have to <laughs> I don't see. Know. Put, move those know. theater seats up to the yeah. living room. Yeah. So you talked a little bit about what you wanted, mm -hmm. what, or not what you wanted, but what you liked and what your first impressions yeah. were. You elaborated on that and said what kind of your favorite yeah. things are. Let's transition and give me maybe some things that could be improved, mm -hmm. some things that you didn't necessarily like. I talked about some of my regrets and stuff. What are your insights? You've been in a lot of yeah, theaters. Sure. Sure. Um, you've listened to a lot of stuff. You've been through a lot of demos. What would you have changed or what would you maybe have done differently for the implementation of this room? Yeah, and the great thing I think is that you you have surrounded yourself with people 
possibly know more than you do. Oh, they for sure do. You know? Those are the best people, by the way. Literally. And what they have done is they have caused you to elevate your level of the sound, the, the dynamics. I know you had the gentleman come in and help you position these and place these. And um, you had, um, remind me his name, from Storm. Matt. So Matt came in and, and he's calibrating because Matt's an expert. Yep. He, this is what he does. And it's like, so he's dialing it in and he's teaching you what you can tweak and how you can do this. And then, you know, you get Tony and Nick and they're like, oh, we can kind of make your project. <laughs> they tried. but They did. But if maybe you had the NZ8, they can kind of come in and tweak. And so you're learning from them. And, and honestly, there's just, there's really nothing that goes, oh, gosh. Because I've been in some theater rooms and you try to be very, very nice. Like, sure. Oh, that was great. That was cool. <laughs> and, in, and inside you're going. You could going, be doing that right now, by no, the way. No, no, no. I promise you. And, and you're going, it's just not my style. What I love about the Martin Logans, and I didn't know this, is there's a lot of detail in them. Yes. You know, there's a lot of clarity. I've always been a fan of that. I'm not a guy that really likes a laid back kind of speaker that's just kind of everything kind of blends together. I don't like that. I like being able to hear when we were watching Ready Player One and all the change is flying around. It's almost like you're hearing individual pieces of those coins kind of bouncing around the room from the Atmos tracks to the side surrounds, rear surrounds, fronts. So I definitely like that channel separation and maybe the storm has a lot to do with that Dirac live has a lot to do with that. i don't know maybe. enough about it to give you a definitive answer yeah but overall i mean there's just so many and i think that's something we've got to understand too it's not an individual component sometimes people are thinking man if i just upgrade my avr to a processor that's gonna like change it sometimes it's just a cumulative of all of it put together mm -hmm. things that you've done very well um, my personal preference, I like a big screen. How big is your screen? Because we didn't really. Talk it's a about 120 that. diagonal. I think because we were so embarrassed of the projector. <laughs> <laughs> so it's 120. Yeah. So, so I guess you're if how there's, far? Um, I think main seating position is about 11 feet. Okay, you're 11 feet from 120. Yep. I'm nine feet from, a from one. 150. Yeah. It's, so it's a little like I like that. I, so I can give you that. You'd probably want a little bit bigger room. I think so. Are you acoustically transparent? I am. Okay. Yeah. So. And so that's a little different here because you really can't go much wider. And I think no. one person mentioned if you're sitting way over here. The speakers are in the way. You kind of. But I yeah. can't. So we actually tried during the calibrations yesterday with Storm to yeah. move them and yeah. it just screwed up the imaging. Yeah, mess it up. So your answer to this question would be bigger screen. I would like a bigger screen, but. I don't order, blame you. In order to do that, you would need a bigger room. I could or... go acoustically transparent and move things back. But those are cool looking. Exactly. <laughs> I didn't want to put them yeah. behind a screen. They yeah. were too pretty. Yeah. I it just it would take yeah. away from the electrostatic yeah. feel, which is yeah. what I was going for. But I can... I do like an immersive e e experience, and this even though we weren't like fixated on that. I think you human. did mention. The light was, reflection yeah, from was, the projector. Yeah. So he does have a, a ceiling speaker above, so that's a center channel. But I was seeing some light reflection from that. So maybe adding some of that velvet on those uh, speakers. I saw one of the guys, he even put um, Velcro strips right. on the edge of certain things. I'm like, that's genius, man. Yeah. Because it just makes it black. And like you said, certain paints. It's still reflective, you know. Or it is. If you got aluminum, like he had, um, like the drop ceiling. So he just put those strips on all wow. of the metal pieces. And I'm like, I would have never thought of no. that. But making that just black, so um, I would definitely get some cooler screws to mount. You don't your like vent. the you don't like the vent kind of sitting <laughs> an inch it's, away from the ceiling. It's like ready to drop. Man. <laughs> Make okay. sure. You... So here's one thing that I would personally change, and, and I didn't do this in my theater for a long time, is I would show a video and people would always comment, you know, you really ought to, to paint your uh, candlelight rings. I'm like, I don't really want to do that. And then, you know, there's an air vent. I'm like, oh, I don't want to really do that. Finally, one day I'm like, you know what? I need to do it. Mm -hmm. So for me, and I know you didn't install that part, but even looking up, it would be really cool if those little white plates were black um, and the speaker wire was black just so that it would just kind of disappear. Uh -huh. Because if you look up, like my eyes are attracted to 
the white because it's contrasting everything that's up Valid. there, which is black. Yep. Um, and and that's just a cosmetic thing. But as far, I mean, I know you got to paint that because that that was that was back a, off uh, my skunk strip. <laughs> skunk strip, okay? Just no, no, let that be. <laughs> I'm just glad we don't have water falling on it. So, <laughs> so that's good. Um, but sound wise, like legit, I would not change anything in here. I can't see, you know, any area that I would improve. Um, you've got plenty of bottom end, plenty of, of deep bass. You've got plenty of tactile feel, both from the regular subwoofers and the butt kickers. Um, and I love how you've got everything incorporated. So I just have my lights incorporated into we got to change that her. Um, but I don't really, I just don't know that area that that we can much. make that happen. Yeah, I bet. And so might have to uh, get your insight on that. But that would be cool to be able to go turn on this and it just like movie time and I just quite haven't gotten there I started it but then I did I kind of got lost and I'm like ah, I'll just I can hit my harmony sure button but harmony's going out of business so yeah yeah it is unfortunate yeah um, well I appreciate you guys coming out I appreciate you giving me the feedback it was it was an awesome time to be yeah. able to have you out I've watched your videos it's it's just amazing to really I've seen you from the beginning to see how you've grown and it's been a it's just been really cool to see where everything's gone so to have you out here and really evaluate my theater and um, say the things that you like didn't like it's just it's been a great experience I really am very very gracious for you having come out here and gone through all of this with us and likewise I'm extremely grateful I had a chance to meet you hang out enjoy your incredible home theater and guys, if you like these types of videos, definitely let me know down in the comments below like what you like about is, do you like this format, this uh, conversational kind of style? I know it's different, but we're gonna try some new things to see what you like. Um, but we've also got a lot more of this planned. Um, I've even got a trip scheduled over to Barcelona, Spain. I've got some I'm trips. I'm envious. Yeah, I've got some trips uh, scheduled up in Indiana. And then we're going to be doing a Florida home theater tour. So if you're interested in doing something like this, definitely check out my website, hometheatertours.com. Submit your site. Um, you know, it does cost money to come up here. So hopefully we can find maybe a sponsor that'd be willing to kind of see the vision of doing this and how it brings people together and how it just gets people excited about home theater. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed these videos. Make sure you subscribe because we've got several more. We've got probably another seven in this series of videos. And as always, you guys be blessed and we'll catch you in the next video.